Hey guys, Colin here, hope you're well. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at a Kronos Bank Introsion sample, which hides all of its badness in some encrypted contents within its resource section. I'm gonna show you how to decrypt that, I'm gonna show you how to dump it, and then perform some initial analysis on that, and you, then you can play around with the actual uh, Bank Introsion at your leisure. So this particular sample was uploaded to VirusTotal about a week ago. If you don't have an intelligence account with VirusTotal, you won't see this download button. If you do, then great. If you don't, then Google the hash that I'll put in the description, and you'll find plenty of other places that you can download the malware from. If you want to play along in your lab. Uh, so I've got this in a Windows 10 virtual machine. One of the first things I like to do with any binary when I perform some analysis on it is stick it in PE Studio. This is a super cool piece of software which will give you some uh, very, um, very cool initial triage of a sample to let you know whether you're dealing with any badness and where to focus your efforts as well. You can see it gives you the information from VirusTotal as well, give you all the AV engine uh, information about it. It will give you some key indicators as to where it thinks there's or why it thinks there's some badness going on with the particular sample you're dealing with. But actually what gets my attention here here is the resources section. Uh, so we can see that it says resources unknown and the unknown has come from this particular uh, part of the resource section, uh, name 106 type J. It's got this unknown signature. It's 302 kilobytes in size, which is super weird, right? Uh, and actually, um, P Studio gives you the option to dump this. So we'll just call this uh, J for now. I stick it on my desktop and have a look at it in HXD. We can see that it's all kind of gobbledygook, right? There's no kind of strings going on in here that uh, really make this any kind of sensible data. Uh, what you should just kind of pay attention to is maybe the kind of str uh, the, uh, the hex values that this starts with, uh, because we'll see this uh, in a few minutes time when we actually analyze the binary itself. So DD, CC, D9, CA, whatever, um, just kind of have that the back of your mind and, and hopefully you'll see that uh, where that appears again shortly. So we've got this weird uh, resource section from our binary. Um, also what I want to do then is have a look and see whether or not there are any kind of uh, cryptography indicators or encryption or decryption algorithm indicators within the binary. And I like to use um, a piece of software called SIG and Search or a script from uh, which is preloaded onto the Remlux distribution. You can get this as an IDA plugin. It's, I think it's a Python uh, script as well, so you can run it pretty much anywhere. It just happens to be on my Remlux distribution here at the moment. Uh, so what you can do is just feed uh, SIG and Search the actual name of the binary and it will perform a quick check to see whether or not there's any heuristics of encryption or decryption algorithms at play. What you can see here is it's flagged up a few things for us. Uh, but the main one being the use of TEA encryption decryption. TEA stands for Tiny Encryption Algorithm. If you do some Googling around it, it's a very uh, weak encryption cipher. However, it's commonly used within malware because it's fairly easy to actually implement, uh, certainly within assembly and certainly within uh, slightly higher level languages like C, C++, C++ etc. Uh, the key, the signature that it's found is the fact that it's got a Tiny Encryption Algorithm uses these two particular constant uh, values within its code and it's found those particular values within our code so therefore that's indicative of tiny encryption uh, being at play. The good news is for us we can copy that uh, value or at least one of those values. We can take uh, our binary, we can stick it into a disassembler, so we'll put it in x32dbg. Let's go to the main module and what we can do is right click, go for, uh, search for uh, current module and we can look for a constant value. We can paste in that expression and we can see here is the actual instruction where that particular constant is being used and it's a move instruction. It moves it into a particular location. So what we can do here is we can double click it, actually go to it and now we'll find ourselves within the tiny encryption algorithm part of the code. So that's cool, right? So what we can do is set a breakpoint. We can then press F9 and we can get there ourselves uh, through all of the instructions. We're not going to go any further just yet, but what we're going to see is a couple of things in memory, what's going on within the actual registers and, and how that equates to memory. So what Tiny Encryption is doing, if you just go a, a couple of uh, instructions above here, we've got some moves into the register. So we can see that EDX is being used, EAX is being used, and ECX looks like it's being used for a counter, etc. Um, and if you do your homework, if you do some reading up on Tiny Encryption and how it works, uh, certainly within an assembly point of view, you will see that EAX is used to store the key that's used to either encrypt or decrypt, and EDX is actually used to um, store the, the message that you're either encrypting or decrypting. So what we want to do here is actually dump out the contents um, or follow in the memory rather, um, have a look in the, in the dump what's in EDX. So we'll follow that in the dump and actually you'll see here um, the, the hex values, DD, CC, D9, CA, etc. So they, this is uh, the same values that we saw as the start of the same values in that resource section J that were super weird. So we know that that uh, particular resource has now been loaded into memory, it's been loaded into the EDX register 
register um, and now is being iterated through by the tiny encryption algorithm. And in fact, if I keep pressing F9, I'll keep coming back to the same breakpoint and just watch that code in the dump there in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. You can see that start to update on every iteration or every loop of the tiny encryption algorithm, every round that it does, it will, it will decrypt a certain portion of data. Uh, what I don't want to do is just keep pressing that for 302 kilobytes worth of data. What we need to do is find out like kind of where this encryption algorithm ends in the code, break out of it, and we can just kind of dump the contents uh, from, from, from the uh, outside of it. So let's take that uh, breakpoint uh, here that I've got off. Let's just scroll down a little bit and we can see where the code ends. We can see here's the return statement. So let me take a breakpoint here and get to that return. Let me take the breakpoint off and we'll take one more instruction. We'll press F8 and we'll come out of the tiny encryption algorithm code. And we can see here that actually in, within the main module, this is the kind of loop that's being called to iterate over the tiny encryption algorithm. So I don't want to keep going through the loop. What I want to do is, is set a breakpoint outside of the loop. And you can see here that I've just set one uh, on this move, ESP, uh, move EBP into ESP. ESP, um, which is outside of the the main body of the loop. So let me press F9, and we can see here that all of the all of the um, contents now of uh, the EDX register, all of that contents of the the resource section has now been uh, decrypted by that uh, by all of those rounds. So I didn't have to keep pressing F9 through the algorithm. It's now done that for me because I'm outside of the encryption algorithm loop. What I can now do is actually follow this in the memory map, so I can see uh, within the memory map where. Uh, that decrypted contents exists, uh, and here we can see this highlighted grey row. Here is exactly where it's um, is where it's located, and I can actually dump that memory to file as well. So let me call it uh, whatever dot bin. Let me just save it to the desktop, and that's great. What we can now do is put that bin file in a hex editor. And we can see what's in here, right? Um, so it might not be anything useful. It might be, it might not be. Hopefully what we'll find in uh, in this binary somewhere is there's gonna be an executable. So something with an MZ header that can, uh, something we can then further reverse engineer. So let's scroll down a little bit. We can see there's, there's definitely ASCII text now. So we didn't see this before. We saw a load of gobbledygook. Uh, we can see there's all sorts of stuff going on here, which um, you know is definitely worth if you wanted to really get your get your teeth into Kronos and how it works and all the rest of it and, and the config behind it you know go through all of the stuff that's in this particular uh, part of the memory and you can see exactly what it's doing under the hood um, so super interesting stuff here I'm going to make life a little bit easier for me so I'm going to have a look at I'm going to do control F and I'll do 4d5a and I'm going to look for uh, the hex values 4d5a and we can see here that actually yes indeed buried within this uh, the contents of this resource section that's now been decrypted is an executable with an MZ header so you can see the dos stub uh, you can see the MZ header 45a which equate, equates to MZ uh, so we've got an executable so what we need to do is just get rid of all of the stuff above it uh, and it'll just take a little a little minute just to, for me to select all of this stuff and there's definitely other ways that you can do this if you wanted to but nice and easy just to kind of copy and paste or copy and uh, delete uh, rather all of the contents above it and that will just leave us with the the MZ header at the top of this file and we can save it out as a new executable and then that should be the actual Kronos uh, Trojan unpacked and, and we in its unpacked format in its raw state and we can then perform our additional analysis so I'm now at the top let me right click I'll press delete it's going to ask me from sure I'll say yes and we can see that now at the top of the code is the MZ header that we're interested in so let me save that out that's cool I'll call this Kronos uh, dumped dot uh, exe that's cool and then we can see we've got this executable here that we can now stick again in, the, in a disassembler and see what we've got. Um, so what we hopefully what we'll see is we've got some strings which will indicate that we're we're definitely dealing with some valid code here. Let me go current module and we'll look for string references. Looks good to me. We can see percent bot ID percent, which is um, very indicative of uh, Kronos and how it uh, inter interacts with uh, its C2 and how it's uh, and what it's working under. Uh, we can also see some other stuff which is of interest to us. We've got local host stuff going on. We've got API calls. We've got get. HTTP, uh, gzip, um, and then loads of other really, really useful stuff. Um, we can kind of go through this with a fine tooth comb, but this is uh, one of the things that it'll actually do. This is an interesting string if you wanted to follow this and, and you will see this in behavioral analysis if you actually run the binary yourself. This chrome.exe and dash dash disable HTTP2, it will actually replace the, the shortcut of your chrome uh, or um, yeah, your, your, your chrome um, your Chrome short, shortcut, if it's on your desktop or what have you, it will replace that with its own link uh, and it will have this uh, argument pasted after it, which is disable HTTP2, which will uh, 
um, degrade the security of your browser and that's what it aims to do right so there's loads of other stuff that it will do under the hood to, to make sure that you're in a, a weakened state from a security perspective but also that it, it can steal your credentials from a banking perspective as well so uh, so here we see some registry stuff we see some folder stuff and we, we see here there's a big list uh, of again what look to be encrypted strings and these are actually how it hides some of the API calls that it's looking for so definitely worth a Google of that as well uh, and loads of stuff that you can now get your teeth into right you've got the binary and it's raw format and so you're in a state where you can go and play with this um, uh, until your heart's content what I wanted to show you is how to extract the encrypted contents we've done that super quickly hopefully that was really useful for you hopefully you've seen a couple of the tools that I like to use along the way as well and hopefully this will help you in your analysis going forward okay thanks guys cheers